Hello there, my name is Gary Sims and this is Gary Explains. Now I was putting together a video about the history of computer programming languages right back from the beginning with things like Fortran through to the modern day with things like Golang and Kotlin. And I realized as I was going along, I was explaining different types of programming languages. And I realized it would be easier to do a separate video on different types of programming languages and then go back and do the history because by then you'll know what all those different types mean. So if you wanna find out what types of different programming languages there are, please let me explain. Now, like any comparison, of course, there are maybe a hundred different ways that I could look at how one language compares to another, but I want to look at five major differences between the most common programming languages. And they are, first of all, how the program is run. Is it compiled? Is it interpreted? Secondly, does it have strong typing? Does it have dynamic typing? Does it have static typing? Does it use object orientation? Does it have a garbage collector? And does it offer concurrency? Okay, so the first thing we need to look at is if the program is compiled or interpreted. What does that mean? Well, an interpreted program, you basically get a script, that's a text file that you've typed in, and then you just run it. You say, run this script using the language, and it starts looking at it one line at a time, doesn't look ahead to see what's at the bottom, and it just keeps going until maybe there's an error in the program and there it just stops because it's just got to that point, or it runs successfully and just keeps on going. But every time it runs, it's actually interpreting that line again. Now there are technologies to speed that process up, but in general, what happens is it goes one line at a time. If it jumps somewhere else, it goes there in the code and it just looks at these lines one line at a time, dynamically interpreting it as it goes. Now, a compiled language is a bit different. With a compiled language, first of all, you run it through a compiler, which means you take your program, which is written in a text editor or in some kind of IDE, and then you compile it to produce a binary and executable for the platform, whether that's Windows or Linux or uh, Mac OS. There is a third variation, which is where there is intermediate code. Way back when, when they were porting Pascal compilers from one mainframe to another mainframe, they found that actually this could be quite a difficult task. So they came up with the idea of a Pascal compiler that produced P code for porting. And this intermediate language was actually uh, used on every machine and on the different system you were porting it to, you just had to create an interpreter or some kind of virtual machine that would run that P code. And that made the porting of the compiler from one system to another system much, much easier. And in fact, we still use this idea today when you come to things like Java and C Sharp. So for Java, you have the byte code, which runs on a Java virtual machine, and that's what happens today on Android smartphones. Apps are compiled to Java, byte code, the byte codes then run on a Java virtual machine. And then of course you've got C Sharp, which runs on the CLR, which is the runtime environment for the .NET framework. So you've got interpreted, which would be a language like Python. You've got compiled, which would be something like C. And then you've got intermediate code, which would be something like Java with its byte code. So let's talk about typing for a moment. Now in some languages, if you want to assign five to a variable, you have to tell the compiler that that variable can take a whole number. So we call those integers. So in C, you might say int x is equal to five. And that tells the compiler that it's an integer, can go into x and five, of course, is an integer. But in other languages like Python, what you actually get is dynamic typing because you can just say x is equal to five. And the interpreter says, well, five is a number, so we're gonna say that therefore x can hold integers. And then you also get strong typing and weak typing, which means that in some languages you can swap between different types very easily. So if you've got a long, which is a way of storing a big number, you can maybe transfer that to an integer, which is a shorter number without much effort. Other languages make you really, really kind of say, I want to convert this integer into an, a long and, and, and so on. So strongly typed languages really make you say what you're intending to do and weaker typed, lang uh, typed languages let you just kind of do it in a more blase fashion and we just kind of hope it all works out at the end. Now another thing to consider is garbage collection. When you have a complex program, you're probably dynamically allocating memory. You want a space for a string, you want a space for a table, you wanna do something with a matrix and you kind of allocate that memory as you are running the program. 
Now, once you finish with that variable, once you finish with that string, once you finish with that table, what happens to that memory? Well, in some systems, you have to explicitly say, I want to free that memory. That memory is no longer being used. Other systems which have a garbage collector, they work out that you're no longer using that variable. There's no links to it kind of dynamically in the program as it's going along. There's no reference counts. That's the uh, kind of the term that's used. And it will then go through the uh, list of things that I no longer use and it does garbage collection kind of freeing up all the memory as it goes along. Now, garbage collection is great in the sense that you don't get memory leaks because the compiler and the program kind of get the idea of uh, freeing up the memory you don't need, but there can be an overhead because you can be running something and then suddenly the garbage collector says, oh, I'm gonna run now. And just as you were about to you know, do something that was time critical, then there's a pause because the garbage collector has decided to start tiling up the memory. So there are arguments for and against whether you want to have garbage collection. Now, a language like C does not have garbage collection. You have to manually allocate and free up, deallocate any memory. And a language like Java has a garbage collector so that when you're no longer using certain things, they will get removed from memory automatically. Another important aspect, of course, of a program now is, is it object oriented and that basically means can you create classes can those classes be inherited and so on now basically the idea here is that you might say i want to define a type of vehicle and then a type of vehicle might be kind of commercial or it might be kind of a family and then under family you might say that it's a car and under commercial you might say it's a truck and then you might say it's a truck with so many wheels and so on and so on so you can kind of build up this hierarchy of objects that reflect kind of the real world and they relate to each other so they're cars and trucks are both types of vehicle at the top level but only car is a type of family vehicle and only truck is a type of commercial vehicle and so on now again, there are lots of pros and cons for object-orientated versus non-object-orientated. Certainly object-orientated was very much in vogue. We've got things like C++, C Sharp, Java, all object-orientated languages. Uh, when you come to language like Golang, then that has stuck with the tradition of things like C, where it's not object-orientated. And the final thing I want to mention is, does the language support concurrency? And by concurrency, I mean, can you say in the program, do these two things at once? Now, some languages just don't have any concept of that built into the language. For example, C doesn't have a concept of that built into the language, whereas Golang has that idea that you can say, run this function, run this function, do them please in parallel. Now, of course, concurrency is a difficult thing to master when you're a programmer because there are things happening simultaneously. There can be race conditions where two functions try to access the same thing at the same time. And the different languages with concurrency generally try to work out the best way to allow concurrency to happen without creating the problems. But I do want to put a caveat on that is, of course, that most languages, you can add concurrency to it via the operating system. So, for example, in C, you can, of course, call operating system level functions to create tasks or processes that do things in parallel. So even in a language like C, you can get concurrency, even if it's not built into the language kind of in the specification. So if you are new to programming, you just want to get yourself up and running, then I would recommend you use Python. You can get yourself up and running very quickly and get a program that does something quite simple. I have a video linked here that shows you how to install the stuff you need and write a very quick Python program. And of course, if you're interested in developing uh, apps for Android, then I have a whole uh, Android development course over at digitacademy.com. That will be linked in the description below. Go over there where you can get over six hours of video of me teaching you how to write apps for Android. My name is Gary Sims and this is Gary Explained. I really hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do give it a thumbs up. Also, don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to share this on social media. Please do go down to the comments below and let's engage in a conversation about different programming language types. And well, that's about it. So I'll see you in the next one.